What's up? This is David Lee Kim, co-founder of Omniscient Digital, and you're listening to The Long Game. In this episode, we hear from Francesca Crihelli. Francesca is the Senior Director of Growth Marketing at Sneak, a cybersecurity company focused on helping developers stay secure. She previously spent eight years at MongoDB, working in many parts of the marketing org from developer relations to account-based marketing. In this conversation, she shares how she thinks about building communities and how the best developer communities and marketers focus on understanding developers' pain points and making their lives easier. Full stop, there's nothing fancy about it. We also discuss how developers aren't the only discerning folks to market to, and this is a challenge that B2B marketers need to overcome. She shares the work that she and her team are doing on SEO and conversion rate optimization, and how they're running a product-led growth playbook for an enterprise cybersecurity software product. That's not what you would typically expect. Francesca also shares some of her personal background on how she went from studying computer science to sociology and history and eventually moved into tech. This was a fascinating conversation. I think you'll enjoy it. Here's my conversation with Francesca Crihelli. Francesca, it is so great to have you on The Long Game today. Thanks for making the time. So great to be here. So you're currently Senior Director of Growth Marketing at Sneak. You're focused on developer experience, which I think is code for marketing to developers. Uh, and I did some digging and saw you did a talk back in like 2014 at OSCON about community and turning community members into heroes. So I just want to call out, you've been thinking about this stuff before it became a trend and before everyone started talking about it. So amazing. Um, but I think building communities is still kind of, a, kind of a nebulous thing for a lot of folks, right? People say they want to do community, they start a Slack channel, and that's it. It becomes, I call it a graveyard of self-promotion. No one's really engaging anymore. So maybe to start, how do you think about building community? What does that look like at Sneak? Yeah, that's such a good question. And for so many developer tools companies, community is the way that they they drive their growth and they get started because there's a really strong and passionate community that found an answer to one of their core problems in your product and they're excited about it um and with sneak it's it's the same i think i think with sneak it's more so that the the change that we're looking to usher into the market around this thing called DevSecOps, which is like DevOps, um, but with security in it all the time. So it's basically bringing all these different technical groups together across the IT and R&D organization that never really talked to each other and often stood in the way of one another and helping them work together so that they can release software that's safer, release it faster and work more harmoniously together. And I think that's the community that is that we really resonate with. And that comes to us. And so we have a lot of DevSecOps practitioners, people who want to usher in DevSecOps into their organization Mm -hmm. um, in our DevSecOps community. And um, it's really exciting. That's the super passionate community. We keep it super vendor neutral. And that's one Mm -hmm. thing I love about it is that it's not about sneak. It's about the principles that are going to help you be successful in your organization. And to me, that and the you know solving someone's problems and giving them other folks to connect with that's what makes a community great um and the communities i find that are most engaging both in b2b and in b2c um those are the ones that are most successful the one that i bring up all the time is uh like glossier has uh glossier is a Mm -hmm. you know cosmetics company and skincare company um, but they have a blog that was their original um product it's called into the gloss and that community is so engaged (laughs) they respond to like every post like one of my favorite things that they do is they sometimes one of their posts is just like a thread post or it's like hey what's the book that you're reading right now and i have that i have those blog posts bookmarked on my browser because 
Oh, interesting. I sometimes yeah. go back and read like recommendations that people have. Um, and I'm kind of like a skincare junkie. Like I love talking about, you know, keeping your skin healthy and, um, you know, wearing SPF. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so, so those, those communities, like I understand the value and I understand how fun it can be. And so when people come to me for advice on like, how do we build the developer community? Um, that's usually the guidance I give them. It's like, let's look at what's successful here. And oftentimes the founder of a startup is the one that's coming to me. And I usually tell them like, you were in the same position as these people. You had this problem. You saw this problem. You understood the severity of it. You are a core member of this community too. So how do you want to relate? How do you want to connect with people? And that keeps it really passionate. Um, I know that our founder of Sneak Guy Pajarni, he started a podcast like right around when Sneak got started called The Secure Developer, where he just Mm -hmm. talks with industry experts. It's also super vendor neutral. It's not really tightly aligned with Sneak, although Sneak is considered its like sponsor. And it's such a good podcast. He does such, I mean, he's really talented and does an amazing job. But I think the reason why people love it so much is it's really candid conversations and it's not about Sneak. It's about how are you helping to create a more secure world in your organization? And um, if you haven't listened to it, I definitely recommend going to some of the um, to going to some of the past recordings. I know that one of the books that I've been meaning to read on my Kindle, he has the author um, coming onto his podcast at sometime soon. Um, you said it was the and, secure developer. Yeah, and okay. uh, the author of this is how. They tell me the world ends. Um, oh yeah, Nicole Perlroth. Yeah, she's coming mm-hmm. to speak with him, um, and I'm really excited. And also, it pushed me to read her book because it's been on my list for so long. I finally, was like, okay, library, we're going there, getting this book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds like the at least coming from my experience, I was at Fishtown Analytics DBT for a little bit, and what you're talking about reminds me of kind of what Tristan, the founder, did there, where just start a Slack group. We're like, hey, let's talk about analytics here and what we're working through and there wasn't any sense of marketing or selling anything it was just a group of people trying to figure out similar challenges and it sounds like if you can just provide that environment for your target type of developer then it should resonate as long as you're not bsing as long as you're actually talking about real problems um and, and you, creating space for people to talk about those problems too yeah i'm going to i'm going to bring us back to the beginning there where you mentioned DevSecOps and how those are typically different teams at a company. Sometimes they're conflicting. It seems like part of Sneak is bringing those folks together and saying, hey, we're on the same team. Is that kind of what also differentiated Sneak from like other communities? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think I think the approach that Sneak's product took to this problem of developers, security folks, and operational folks in IT not being aligned on how software delivery should work and not working in the same ways. I think their approach to it was very much like, let's design it, integrate it into the developer toolkit because every other approach slows developers down. Mm -hmm. And it's the same tenets of DevOps. You know, DevOps is like, let's help accelerate development through operations. Um, and so I think that that idea, I wouldn't say that sneak coined that idea, but mm. the, um, the conversations that we're creating around it are definitely resonating with people and the product definitely helps to facilitate that because it's designed to be in the developer workflow. And so yeah. it helps developers be more successful. Um, and it scales out the security program. And some of the rules, which makes it easier for the security team to implement it into the developer's toolkit. And then it it's inclusive of operations because it functions on all of these integrated tools. So the DevOps team gets more um, credit for all the work that they do. And I have to give a shout out to my colleague, Sam Hepburn, who's been at Sneak for a really long time and has been the original community manager, probably after Guy, who was such a fantastic community manager um, as a CEO and founder. Um, and now he's the president, but Sam Hepburn has done an amazing job cultivating that community. 
some of the most impressive people in the DevSecOps space and in the operations space, you know, consider us their friend um, as a result mm-hmm. of the efforts that they put in to get wow. to know those people, to give them a platform, um, and also using them to help us understand, like, how can we do a better job here? So she's done an amazing, amazing job. And I think if you're thinking about starting a community, it takes that kind of dedication to really understanding the space, understanding the people. Yeah, that makes sense. And shout out to Sam. Shout um, out to so, Sam. She's the best. <laughs> from, so from my understanding of the thing I hear across the board, and um, I've worked with a couple of these more technical products targeting, like where the end users, developers, sounds like across the board, a lot of people would say that this is a very challenging group of people to market to. Why is that? Um, that's a really good question. So I actually think that every group is really hard to market to these days because everyone's really skeptical and Mm -hmm. we all know what marketing is. Um, and we've all seen it. It's not like, you know, the sixties where you could, (laughs) and the seventies where you have like a commercial with people singing Coke, you know, (laughs) about Coca-Cola and like everyone is so excited and united by the idea the of commercials are still like that <laughs> I, yeah. actually the i was thinking about it i was listening to a podcast the other day speaking of podcasts um they were talking about the coke ad you know i'd like to buy the world of coke and how that was just so beautiful and then the share a coke campaign that they did where they had people's names on the coke and it, and it mm-hmm. kind of made them feel special i was thinking how how cool that was they like were able to bridge it from you know, that idea of feeling connected. But anyway, every group of people is really hard to market to because we we all know a little bit more than we did before. We're all much more discerning consumers. I think developers are really hesitant. And I don't mean to speak for all developers. I just want to clarify and make sure that everyone knows, like, I don't mean to speak for all developers. I've met and marketed to developers and I've also like worked with them. And so this is my understanding from, from this experience. But from what I understand, developer tools are our development as a, you know, as a practice and any technical job, it's, it's hard. Everything that you do involves like edge cases and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, things can go really wrong if you use the wrong software. And sometimes something that you try on your own laptop is not going to scale up to production. So there's, there's, I I think the repercussions of choosing the wrong software and making those incorrect decisions are really high. And so they're more discerning because they don't want to get stuck in those complicated situations they have to they don't want the software that they choose to um make them spend more time on something that they don't want to (laughs) they want to simplify everything um and if you ever looked at the developer's workflow like there's a lot of tools involved there's a lot of process and um the actual art of doing software development and solving those problems is incredibly taxing on the mind (laughs) it takes a long time and it takes a lot of focus so they're really discerning about these things because they don't just want you to say, this is better than anything you've ever tried because they don't believe that that could possibly be true. (laughs) And they've been lied to before. So so that's my take on why they're very difficult to market to. Um, But my guidance for everyone, whenever they get started, is like speak to them in their language, help them understand how what you're doing can help them, not why it's the best thing in the world. And how it's the best version of what they've ever seen you do, but help them understand the problems that you solve. Um, be really direct, be honest, show rather than tell. So a lot of the times now when you go to a developer tools website, you'll actually see like a console or a terminal window. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that black background with white text and or sometimes, you know, colored text um, that indicates, you know, different functions. And that's done to show developers like this is how much easier you could you could build something so much simpler with what we offer compared to what you you're doing already um or you can initiate software so much qu- more quickly by using what we offer um and that's taking the show don't tell method of let's show developers how is this going to work in your world mm-hmm. uh, you mentioned something really important where it's not just Develop, it's not like developers are snowflakes and like need to be catered to to like market to. It's just we're all much more discerning consumers, whether it's B2C or B2B. And I've even had conversations with friends where as someone with a marketing background, I know when I'm being marketed to. Like I have a keen eye looking at commercials and I'm like, I don't understand who this is for, first of all, but that's a different story. 
But I've had friends who don't have a marketing background say, I know when I'm being marketed to now. So as folks in this profession, how do we, I guess, reconcile that? Like, I know there seems to be a trend of like more self-aware marketing, but I'm curious how you think about like, what does B2B marketing look like in a world where our target buyers are so discerning? That's a good question. Uh, and I'm going to give kind of a boring answer, but I think the answer is education and helping people mm -hmm. get educated first and providing more value up front. Um, and I think the times where folks get it wrong is when they just don't understand enough about who their target audience is and don't understand their pain points, um, or they think they understand and try to simplify it. Mm -hmm. um, just back to basics. And yeah. And, and so, so I think, um, or they try to simplify the problem so much in a way that's easy to communicate. And then folks who are more discerning will say, well, it's actually not that simple. It's, it's more complicated than that. So, um, so yeah, I think it's really knowing your, con your consumer. I think at first, when you first get into the world of doing this type of marketing to this audience, just like you would with any other audience, try to go to the subject matter experts or the people themselves and get mm -hmm. their perspective on what's working and what's not. Um, one thing that we do whenever um, we do a lot of user research at Sneak. And one of the things I did a couple of years ago was we were told to update the website homepage. <laughs> and, um, <Okay>. and they <laughs> said, <That's big. laughs> uh, by, by, by our, um, by our leadership. And so, um, so immediately I sat down with the designer and I said, okay, we're going to have to, I was like, I want some information about what people like and what people don't like. I don't want to go to the exec team and say, here's what our design is because they're going to pick it apart and say they don't like it. And I want to have some real information to say, well, this is why we made this decision and I want everything to be really intentional. So what we did is we, um, I asked the designer, I was like, pull your sites for inspiration and tell me why you like them. And we took a few of those sites and we put them through a user testing study and we got developers who, um, like we, we picked a segment of developers and we asked them, you know, what do you think about this page? What do you think the next best action should be? Like, talk to us about what you feel about this page. And we got really valuable insight into like why people yeah. liked certain things, why they didn't. And everything so that, that we that was built, about other webs, about other websites, like other developer of tools. Oh, other okay. developer tools yeah. websites yeah and so what we did is we took the insights from there 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 were like a couple of things we gathered in terms of like um like i think there were some i i think some of the the general feedback was like they liked when things were very clearly explained they liked when there were um uh ways to dig through the different elements of the product in a really simple way uh they loved knowing who the product was for and the value that it would give to different folks. So for example, mm -hmm. a segment site does a really good job of under helping you understand how marketers and analysts and developers all get value from segment. Um, and everything that we, everything, everything we developed for that, that version of the homepage where we said, okay, we're going to take this insight and make it our own. Everything that we did when we did subsequent research those are the things, those were the elements that people loved. When we came up with our own stuff, those were the things that people liked the least. So, so I think one, one thing that I learned from that is like, always do user testing before you release something. Um, mm -hmm. And always do it before you start something because you need to have some background so that you can um, have defensible reasons for why you design something. Um, yeah. So now the way we do that um, at Sneak, we have um, a more robust conversion optimization program. And so um, my team, it's in conjunction with the digital marketing and the um, website team. And my team works with them to define a list of activities we want to do and some optimizations we want to make. They're usually based on our company priorities or our core like team priorities. And whenever um and then they'll do their research and understanding and then whenever they come to me with the design or to our group with the design they have to say these are the changes we made this is why we made them mm. and this is the result that we're going to expect and it's really simple 
but not often done because, uh, and that's one thing that helps, uh, I think, uh, it helps constrain the feedback that you get on specific designs. Um, because one of the challenges with anything related to design is that you get a lot of people who aren't designers saying, I don't like that. <laughs> and you don't know why. And yeah. they don't know why you made something that way uh, or why you chose to make those decisions. So it just helps it helps everyone focus the conversation in a way that is constructive and allows us to make the best possible outcome for yeah. a, and help us move forward in a way that allows us to build a better design for the end user. I I love that a lot. Coming, I came from a growth, growth background at HubSpot. Um, so I'm going to ask a very tactical question. That pitch you have to the market, the, the rest of the marketing team around like the change we need, why results we expect. What does that look like? What does that artifact look like? Is it like a slide deck? Is it a Google Doc? Like how is so, it spread? So it hasn't permeated it hasn't permeated the whole marketing team, but it's okay. in our um we have a like we have a team internally that we are working on where we're working on conversion optimization. Um, the team is called Project Zebra, and we meet once a week uh, in our weekly dazzle because a group of zebras is a dazzle. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we, so this is something that we were starting to do, and I'm trying to push the team to do whenever they present a design to me. And then what they did is at the when we shared this with the group, like the initial. Um, set of optimizations that we were making, we created, they created like a Figma slide deck um, mm -hmm. that had every change, uh, every, every page we were optimizing or everything that we were doing, the problem it was solving, and then what we were changing about it, and then what we expected. And I think that helped a lot in communicating the results out to a much larger group. Yeah. <laughs> and it, um, and then now when we're posting, hey, we've launched this, this is what the intended impact is. And then we come back two weeks to a month later with um, results on what's happened since. Yeah, I love Using that. a and range of, of tools to understand like a website engagement and things like that. Yeah, that's amazing. And I love that because a year down the road, someone might ask like, hey, why did we make this design decision? You can point them to the Figma file that hasn't been touched yeah. in a year that shows all you're thinking. Um, exactly. Yeah. And it also empowers the team to, to have to articulate why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. And um, rather than saying we made a change, good night. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think the most important thing is then, you know, afterwards, like what are we learning from all of these yeah. changes and all of these things that we're implementing? Yeah, maybe a little rat. One of the things when when I was working in house is a lot of people are like, "Oh, we should test this. We should run this experiment." And our first question was always, "Why? Why do you believe it's worth running? What's the expected result? What's what's the hypothesis behind it?" And get blank stares, right? And it's like, "Well, I'm not saying no. I just want to understand more about why this is worth yeah. it, or else we could be running all these other things too, right?" Yeah, and also sometimes like there's certain things like in this, in this CRO workflow that we're using, there's no experiments. Actually, all of these are JDIs, which, you know, just do just it. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> like there are things that were like, this is so obviously good, a good idea based on things that we know about our users feedback. We've gotten full story mm -hmm. videos, like all of these things. We know that this is the right thing to do. And that doesn't mean we're going to launch it and forget about it, but um, we don't need to spend the cycles implementing the experiment. I think experiments need to be done when like you have, when you really, really, really want to get a null, um, when you really want to um, dispute the hypothesis and you think like yeah. the hypothesis could be wrong. And like um, kind of risky. Exactly. It should be risky. Yeah. The results should, and that's why so often I think experiments come out with um, no results at the end, or they say like you know it's um, it's not significant. Mm -hmm. It's because you're not doing risky enough experiments. Like you should fail a lot of the time. Um, some people actually say like you need to have like a thirty three percent across the board, like thirty three percent failure, thirty three percent wins, and thirty three percent no results. And I think that's fine, and um, more people should push towards that. And I also think more folks should understand that 
you don't need to run experiments to be a yeah. growth minded or like a conversion minded individual. That's just one approach that you can use for very specific situations. Yeah, I love that. It, I had this conversation with a, a really good friend of mine who, who came from CXL, like CRO dude. And I was like, is it just me or do some orgs rely too much on A-B tests when it's like a just do it type of thing? He's like, oh, yeah. Some people just are scared of making decisions and want to do an A-B test and like feel more secure about it. But a lot of those come out inconclusive. Um, so it's it's interesting seeing some of that data dependence culture start coming out mm-hmm. when when you start talking about data. Um, so you're you're talking a lot about CRO. What other types of projects or initiatives are you focused on? Is it mostly CRO across the website? Um, what what are you focused right now? That's a good question. Um, so the makeup of my team is really full funnel. So we have a group that's focused on the CRO um, within the user acquisition group. Um, there's another group focused on SEO specifically. Um, and Sneak has a really powerful growth loop in SEO. So mm-hmm. um, that's really awesome. And that's that's been foundational um, to the product and the company, but we've built on that and we have a really awesome SEO team. Um, super data driven, really passionate about learning about security and about our users. Um, and so we do many different types of SEO. We have content, we have programmatic SEO, and we have technical SEO. Programmatic SEO is like Quora is a great example. Mm, like yeah. you have a system that's constantly creating content and um, has inputs based on either user interaction or data that you're pulling in from other sources and things like that. So we have uh, we have two and we're soon to launch a third programmatic SEO assets like that. Awesome. Um, that are really fun. And, um, and then we also have a content creation program. We work really closely with our DevRel and product marketing teams, and then also have our own content that we create. That's, you know, really top of funnel educational content that can perform well on yeah. um, search. So um, you, you called SEO a growth loop. I don't hear a lot of people refer to it that way. Um, I'm biased. Like I come from an SEO and content background. Like that's where my my roots are. What do you mean that SEO is a growth loop? Because typically when you know growth loops, they're like, oh, virality, referral loops, but you're, you're calling content SEO a loop. Yeah. So um, a great example of this is Pinterest. So with Pinterest, a lot of folks found found Pinterest by searching for an image and then finding one that was on Pinterest and then going to Pinterest, then creating their own pins. And then those pins then get, you know, indexed. And so the loop continues and continues to find users. So we don't have that exact growth loop, but Pinterest did a lot of cool things with SEO. They did a lot of SEO Mm -hmm. AB testing. Um, That growth team was phenomenal. Uh, But what we do, so we have um, two assets uh, one of them is called Advisor. Advisor is a tool that uh, looks at different programming, open source programming languages and the packages specifically, and then uh, pulls in various data sources so that you can make an assessment of what the best package is for your project. So if you're oh. trying to make a decision on like, should I use this package? You can see the number of contributors, how often it's being maintained, how many security issues it has things like that. And um, as you can imagine, lots of search results. <laughs> um, yeah. And because if you have every per, every package from uh, you know particular programming languages, people are searching for that. And we do a lot of work to um, make the markup of those pages really tightly aligned with Google's algorithm. Um, we want everything to show up as like, you know, a search result or an FAQ, things like that. So there's a yep. lot of work on the site, um, on that part of the site that that's designed with the infrastructure to get discovered by Google. So let's say someone finds that search result for a package they're looking for. They come to the site, they see, oh, wow, this is cool. And they sign up for a sneak. Um, they sign up is for this sneak a separate website? It's a, it's a separate domain on the sneak site. Okay. Oh, so, okay. uh, I so yeah, so, that. so people it's branded as sneak. Um, and, uh, and so they land there, they then see the value and then they sign up 
And then as a result um, of the traffic, that sends quality and the engagement sends full quality signals to Google. So then we get more expertise. Um, sorry, we get more credibility with the algorithm. Yeah. And then the more and more users come in, and then obviously the more users we acquire and the more customers we get, and then we can reinvest that funding into making Advisor a better product for what users need, which is you know mm-hmm. evaluating packages. Um, so that's a really cool growth loop for us. Um, that's and another one is is our vulnerability database, which is a really similar type mm-hmm. of product that looks at all of the CVEs and any open source vulnerability that's been discovered. And so we get a lot of hits to that site as well. Uh, but that's kind of the original programmatic asset and one of the original growth drivers of Sneak because that our product is based on our core product, Sneak Open Source, which is our first product, is based mm-hmm. on the um, vulnerabilities in that database. Got it. So I, I want to, this is getting me more thinking about Sneak as a, a product because you're talking about getting these users onto the platform. So when people think about running a product-led growth or a PLG playbook, I don't think they think enterprise cybersecurity software. Um, <laughs> so that's what I find really interesting about Sneak's business model is there's a lot of folks. So there's a lot of folks who misunderstand what PLG is now, I think, but what y'all seem to be doing is you're running a product-led growth play- playbook and it's it seems like it's accelerating an enterprise sales motion as well. So I'm not sure how much you're allowed to share, but what what does that go-to-market look like? How do you think about that whole system? Yeah. Um, one of the cool things about being an outlier in your industry is that it gives you, it kind of builds a moat <laughs> for you. So um, at Sneak, like none of our competitors offer a self-service, get started for free or get started for free model. And so that helps us stand out a lot. Um, a lot of folks come to us and they say, I really love your transparent pricing. I love that I can start on my own and I love that I can pay on my own and I don't have to talk to anybody. Um, and that's great for us because you know it helps us stand out. And while everyone else is waiting for a response to a demo request, someone else is having a wonderful experience getting to know Sneak. Um, that being said, there's certain um, elements of enterprise adoption that make any kind of product like growth product difficult. Um, primarily, you know, in larger enterprise organizations, you don't have as much freedom and flexibility to implement software on your own. You have to go through a more rigorous yeah. uh, process of procurement. So that becomes more complex. Um, but because it's a developer tool, developers try this stuff out all the time on their own. So they might try it on their own code bases and stuff and then learn about Sneak. Um, and then the other thing is because we're really invested in the developer community, those developers might hear our name someplace else. So I talk to a lot of customers who say to me, yeah, you know, I'm working at this company and then we came across this problem and I had remembered that Sneak solves this problem because I, you know, I saw you guys or some people will say, I saw your logo and I remembered the dog. <laughs> yeah. And then, I ask um, about that. Yeah. and then, um, and then, you know, they'll they'll sign up for s- Sneak again and show everyone what happens. And then they'll say, actually, I um, I think this is the right fit for us. And then there's uh, a deal on the table. Um, so that's a motion that works well. Um, and the other is um, sometimes if there are a considerable amount of developers in an organization that are using Sneak, um, our sales team calls them up and says, hey, did you know that you have X number of developers using Sneak? And um, Usually the security team says, what? There's developers using a security <laughs> software on their own? <laughs> like, Open source. This sounds yeah. great. <laughs> this sounds great. So, um, and I think that highlights the approach that was pioneered by the founders of Sneak, which is that let's think about things that are appealing and interesting and useful for developers first, um, because the security team just has too much going on and they um, they need help and they need their developers to buy into the security approaches that they have decided upon so that they can make sure that their customers are secure. And um, so it's really inspiring to see how, um, you know, see see organizations adopt those practices. Obviously the software doesn't solve everything. It's really like a mindset change first and then the software comes, Um, but it's exciting to see uh, when that happens. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. Like, yeah, even though they're a developer might be at an enterprise company where they can't just, 
spin up a new security tool and use it at the company, they can just go test it out on their own and then come back and try to sell it internally. Like I've already tried this, like I've already vetted it instead of which might accelerate actually selling into the enterprise, hopefully. So that's interesting. I want to ask about the dog. I, I imagine that <laughs> came before you. Um, it did. Do you know what the story is behind that? Like, were there A-B tests or anything around oh, having the gosh, mascot that's a versus question. not? <laughs> I'll have to ask Guy. Um, I know that originally um, they wanted to have someone who was able to protect, but also someone who was sweet and friendly. Um, oh. And so that's why Patch is smiling. <laughs> so his name is Patch. Um, <laughs> he's a really good dog. And... Um, and, um, whenever, whenever any sneaker sees a Doberman in real life, we always take a picture and we're like, it's patch in real life. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I really was tempted to get a Doberman after I joined sneak, but instead I got, um, a little Cocker Spaniel mix. <laughs> so, yeah. well, um, you got two. <laughs> I do. Well, yeah, the other one was already here. Um, but yeah, I have a lab okay. and I have a Cocker Spaniel mix. So, and they're best friends and they're probably sleeping together right now. They're little beds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they wanted, they wanted to represent something that was able to protect and was like a protector and could defend, but somebody who was sweet and kind and friendly. Um, and so we think of patch, uh, or, you know, sneak as your first friend, like your first security friend, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, hire patch onto your team. He's yeah. Really good I love that. Boy. I mean, <laughs> as, as a dog dad myself, any company with a dog as their mascot has is already on my good side. So yeah. I what kind that. of dog do you have? He's a pit bull mix. He's actually sleeping right next to me. Oh, sweetheart. <laughs> oh, is he, what color yeah, is he? He's white. He's white with a brown spot right on his butt. <laughs> oh, boo boo. So cute. <laughs> tells, I love him. Yeah. Me too. Oh, cutie pie. Um, so I have to ask, I did some digging and I saw you went to school for sociology um, and your LinkedIn says like gender feminism, sexual studies, and like uh, a focus on intellectual history. How the hell did you end up in open source software and tech? How do you like? I mean, those skills, those are all incredibly relevant to open the problems of open source software today. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're trying to trying to increase you know diversity and inclusion, trying to improve diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out how to get more contributors, um, <laughs> trying to organize mm -hmm. people. Um, in all seriousness, I, I, uh, studied computer science before college. Um, okay. I yeah. was, I was, um, uh, my school had like those like little computer science classes that were like, um, that taught you some, taught you a little bit. Um, but they, they started expanding them and then, um, I took one of, I took two of the classes with a female teacher. She was the best. And she was like, you're really good at this. You should continue. So I did. And then I had a male teacher and I was in a class full of boys. It was a really small class. It was all boys. And they mm. were all like those, they were really mean to me. And there were all these like kids who were like, they could just like do math from birth. Like they were just like geniuses. <laughs> Yeah, and, and like these like polymaths and then there was me and things were just like not as easy so I had a really hard time in that class because I just wasn't you know one of those like naturally gifted people and my teacher did not like that at all so mm -hmm. so I had a like I just didn't have a lot more a lot of fun although I made a lot of games in class and I used a lot of uh software uh, sorry, I used, I like learned Java, C++. I learned like Visual Basic, all that stuff. And mm -hmm. so then I went to school and I kept thinking, do I want to take computer science? It seems cool, but no, I had a bad experience. So I had a, many different majors at school, uh, like neuroscience, biology, <laughs> you name it. <laughs> but I eventually ended up studying sociology and history and um, had a lot of really great teachers and like just read a lot of cool books. Um, but I the focus on intellectual history is like most of my sociology and history classes were all on theory. So it was all like mm. philosophy and like understanding the past, understanding yeah. humans. What is knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Like stuff like that. So like a lot of the, a lot of the things that I studied were like the Frankfurt school, which was um, a bunch of intellectuals from Germany. They, uh, many of them were Jewish. They fled the war in Europe. Um, and came to the U.S. and started, I think they started working at the new school 
and they um they had like you know their all their philosophy was a reaction to the war um mm. and it was all like this idea of like questioning enlightenment and the rationalization of um you know science and assuming that uh you know eugenics can solve everything stuff like that so they were really they they were like really prolific and um some folks in that group were like horkheimer adorno um and then there's a a theorist in that same um there's there's a more modern theorist Giorgio Agamben who's Italian um but he he's more of like a modern incarnation of that um and then mm-hmm. Herbert Marcuse was was another one um but uh so yeah read a lot of those guys <laughs> and um and then got out of school and was like how on earth do i use all this knowledge <laughs> about like empire and imperialism and <laughs> um and um yeah and like you know critiques of art and photography it was just you know so i didn't really know what to do um and i graduated in the worst time it was um during the financial crisis so i i mm-hmm. it was really difficult to find a job but the cool thing was that at that time although there was like there were not a lot of jobs and not a lot of people were hiring there was this like nascent tech space in new york city and so i ended up meeting some people who were in that space and um I got hired by one of them at MongoDB. So that's how, um, and, and it was honestly just cause I, you know, I said like, oh yeah, I know what open source software is. Like I've used MySQL before <laughs> yeah. and I took computer science classes and I understood like a couple of things and it just, the connection was made and it worked out. So. Yeah. What a whirlwind. Um, I know and for, for what it's worth. I, my, so my sister studied computer science in college and she had the exact same experience. She finished her degree, but it wasn't a great experience for her either. I won't share more I'm details sorry. than that, but it it sounds like a very common thing that I'm frankly like not, I don't think a lot of people are very aware of. Like it's just being- And you know, what's interesting is like back then no one was talking about like, there's not enough women. I mean, maybe people were, I just wasn't aware of it, but I feel like now it's so much more prevalent to talk about mm-hmm. that. And, and I think now there's so many, uh, things being developed to try to inspire young women to see themselves as engineers. Um, like I think a couple of years ago, there were these like programmable rings that they were, uh, that's a company oh. was developing so that, um, girls could learn to program, um, and make their jewelry like light up and stuff. It's just like really simple stuff, but it's cool. And it gets you into it and, and allows you to see how cool, um, building something is. I mean, the thing that I loved about computer science and building, you know, programming in general, um, that I, I've always taken with me is like the problem solving is really hard. And I was really engaged by that. And then, um, it was really cool to like tell a computer to do something and then have it do that. And then understand the steps that you had to do to get the computer to do that thing. And then when you missed a step, um, like I, I would always say to people, the computer just does what you say it should do. Um, and if you missed this step, it was really cool to figure out like, oh, this was that little thing I had to, I had to put in there to make sure that the logic was totally correct. And um, I think that that has followed me a long way because so much of what I think of when I'm in my working life is like, what's the simplest way that we can figure something out together? Um, and oftentimes in, in programming, it is like, what's the simplest way? Because when things are simpler, you have way more errors. It's way easier to debug in the long term. Um, and so I think some of those lessons and then also lessons when I was trying to be a neuroscientist, I took a really hard biology class and mm-hmm. my professor, Yolanda Cruz, bless her heart. Um, she, I went to her office hours cause I was really struggling. And she, she said to me, we were like talking about like nephrons and stuff. And she said to me, Francesca, parsimony is the rule. Always remember the body does the simplest thing it needs to, to get something done. And I, I've taken that with me forever. I'm like the simplest thing, like if we could just distill everything down to the simplest thing and like execute it. Um, and it's helped me so much just in like solving problems with colleagues also, um, in setting up like experiments or just do it. It's like, well, what's the simplest way we can figure out if this works? Um, so those are some of the things that I, I feel like, you know, even if I didn't go down that path, like your sister did, like bless her well done. (laughs) Yeah. But even if I didn't go down that path, I still learned a ton and, um, 
I think that's a great takeaway for most things in life. I mean, yes, business marketing, but even just like personal life, when you find yourself overanalyzing something or like trying to set up a campaign or experiment and you're getting really into the weeds, you're, you're the voice of reason of saying like, how do you simplify this? Like, are all these mm-hmm. things necessary or like, what's the core thing we're trying to get at here? So yeah, I think that's, exactly. that's a great ticket there. Yeah. So maybe uh, some some questions because we're coming up on time here. We'll ask some closing questions um, and we'll keep this as fast paced or, you know, respond with as long of an answer you want. So first question here is what's one opinion you have about business or marketing that you think people would disagree with? Oh, do I have any controversial opinions? <laughs> I don't know. Um all of my controversial opinions are really controversial. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'm excited to hear some hot, like one hot take. Oh my God. I, I just, I'm just thinking about all the people who are going to be really mad at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like actually mad? <laughs> yeah. Like actually offended. <laughs> um, well, I think, I think it's going to take a long time before events really rebound in the way that we, we, th- they used to be. I think marketing events, marketing is going to be really difficult to figure out. And I, I feel like the team that figures it out is, you know, more power to them, but I I think it'll be challenging. Um, And I think it's a good challenge, you know, like what are people going to come in for? Um, What are people going to go out for? Um, So I, I feel like events might become more of a, like less of a like massive conference and more of like, smaller dinners at cool Mm. places with like experiences that you can't normally get. Um, So that's one hot take. Uh, Another is I think brand and performance marketing are like the two most important things that you can do. The two most important focus areas as a business. Um, And brand is like something very complicated and difficult to do. And I think a lot of companies take it for granted and they're like, Oh, we have a great brand. Yeah. (laughs) How do you know that? You have no idea. <laughs> Why? Because your direct traffic is growing? That doesn't mean you yeah. have a good brand. <laughs> it, um, it feels like there's, I don't know if renaissance is the right word, but like a uh, revival of brand marketing because in software, mm-hmm. there's software is a commodity now. I think a lot of companies have dozens, if not more competitors. Maybe Sneak is very special. You're an outlier with like great a, a great moat and differentiation. But for a lot of software, they have a bunch of copycats or other companies that they can't just go feature to feature again. So uh, they need to be spending more time on brand and positioning. And it feels like that hasn't been adopted as widely yet. And everyone's just focused on direct response to man gen. I agree. I agree. And I, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the blockers are like, oftentimes in B2B businesses, like product marketing is kind of like responsible for brand, um, Mm -hmm. which can be in some places, but I feel like that's putting too much responsibility on a team that is supposed to be doing something very different. Um, So yeah, I think, I think brand is definitely taken for granted. I think performance marketing is, is like definitely, I mean, I mean, I'm a little biased because that's like where I live. Um, But I think performance marketing is, is not something you can, um, is something that takes, it's very complicated and it's hard and it's really yeah. data-driven and you need to have the right team in place for that. Um, yeah, you can't just and I also turn think, on some ads and expect the money to come in. <laughs> yeah. And and I and I feel like those things like SEO, paid digital marketing, conversion optimization, um, you know, on-site chat, like all of those things are so hard to do and you really need a, a, like a good, good team and kind of like specialize in a lot of those areas in order to see the results and the same goes with brand you need like and i haven't actually seen it done well at the b2b enterprise level um mm-hmm. like brand building brand campaigns like all that stuff i'm not sure if there's like i would have to rack my brain to think of like really solid examples obviously twilio great brand <laughs> yeah um uh so and i sneak. think that they did <laughs> I think we have the beginnings of a really great brand. I don't think we've really focused enough on building 
an amazing brand. I think we have great word of mouth. And I think our customers are really happy with us, which is so great. It's like really cool to work at a company where your customers are happy. (laughs) So I think that's cool. But, um, and and I, I hope one day that anytime someone sees a Doberman, they think of sneak. Yeah. And well, I the love and will. protection, <laughs> the love and protection they get from the Dobermans. <laughs> um, what is uh, one impactful piece of advice you've been given? Oh, there's two. Um, okay. So Paul Pano, who was my um, physics teacher in high school, he was a tough guy. That was like the hardest class I've ever taken in my life. Was AP Physics, <laughs> and on Fridays we would have a double period of AP Physics. And we would get half and the whole time was just like building stuff. I sound like I went to like a really cool school. I went to public school. I I didn't go to like a (laughs) specialist school, but I had really cool (laughs) teachers, but, but we had this, um, uh, we had, we had like, um, it was kind of like lab time, uh, where we took the like principles and we had to like apply them and see how they worked. And I remember once I was trying to do something. And Mr. Pano came over and he's like, how are you doing, Francesca? And I was like, oh, I'm under so much pressure. This is crazy. And he goes, he just like looked at me and he goes, pressure makes diamonds. And then walked away. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> Paul Pano. <laughs> he had won many, many soccer championships. <laughs> mm-hmm. He was a really, really hard, hard dude. When we were sick, he would say, well, why don't you go run like six miles? You'll feel better. Yeah, he's <laughs> that kind of dude. Um, but that stuck with me. Um, and I gave, I actually gave the commencement address for high school and, uh, during graduation. And I, I said that, and I remember looking at him in the audience and he was like shocked that he, a, he, he told me after he was like, I don't remember saying that. <laughs> and he was like, and I can't believe you remember it. <laughs> um, but class was at 8 a.m. So I understand. Yeah. And then the other thing, um, there was a board member at MongoDB. Um, she was an amazing woman. Um, her name was hope. And, um, she came to talk to the women at MongoDB about like, you know, what it's like and stuff. And one of the things she said to us is something, a mantra that she's held with herself since she was in college was, um, finish the job. She Mm -hmm. never left anything unfinished. She like tried her best. She would like, I wouldn't leave work if there was like unfinished stuff. She always like finished the job. And I, I hold that advice. Like really, I, I hold that advice um, because it's like sometimes really easy to just say, okay, I'm just going to go and like work on this later. But sometimes you have all it, all it need, all you need. Um, even when um, I go rock climbing, uh, I actually went a couple of weeks ago with a guide uh, outside and I climbed some stuff I'd never climbed before. And one of the things he said to me, he was like, you know, I noticed that you sometimes struggle um, to get up like harder walls. And he's like, but you're definitely strong enough. And you're just like, not willing to give up all your energy in some of those moves. And he's like, but you can. Mm. And after that, like the rest of the day, I was like, you know, finishing everything. <laughs> it was yeah. No problem. Cause I, I like understood. And it was the same principle. It was like, you know, just make the move quickly, finish it. And then you can move on to the next thing. Um, so those are two pieces of advice that I find really helpful. I love it. Pressure makes diamonds and finish the job. Finish the Um, job. All right. So next question here. What's one book you'd recommend more people read? Ooh, uh, Seven Powers by Hamilton Helmer. Um, I have not read that one. Oh, it's so good. It's a little theoretical. Um, Mm -hmm. Or sorry, it's a little bit dense is what I mean. Um, And but I like it because it's, it's applicable to every business. Um, he's, he articulates different powers that businesses employ to stay defensible, um, at different stages and then talks about some examples. Uh, and there's certain things in there that you've probably heard of before. Like one of the powers is network effects, which is, you know, common. Another is like switching costs. Um, and, uh, and there's some, there's really cool stories and he's a super smart guy and he was an early investor in Netflix. Um, so, um, yeah, there's, um, there's right. some cool stories from that too. Yeah. Another book I gotta, I gotta pick up. I, so, and, and, you know, once you, 
sorry, David, once you, once you read seven powers, you'll all of a sudden realize that like everyone has read, not everyone, but like you'll find people have read seven powers and you're like, Oh my God, you'll, you'll like hear the the way they talk. Um, and then you find this like huge community online where all they do is talk about stuff. (laughs) So get, (laughs) get excited. Okay. I'm clearly missing out on this community. Um, okay. (laughs) And then how do you continue to get better? Wait, what did you say about the bookshelf? I, oh yeah. I was going to say, so my bookshelf reading ratio it used to be like 80%. Like I felt pretty proud about that, but as of late, I'm just getting so excited about these. I buy a book once I hear it recommended a handful of times, not just the first time I hear it. And so I've slowly just kept buying books and my read ratio is now like 50% or something. So I'm a little bit sad that I won't be able to keep up with my buying of books, but maybe over time I'll find some additional time to get through them faster. I write late. I love going to bookstores. I also love um, Three Body Problem. I don't know if you've read that that one yet, but... I am finishing Death's End, the third book of the trilogy right now. It is mind-blowing. I have like literally 20 pages left and I don't want to finish it because I've just grown attached to these characters. Oh man, I need to read The Dark Forest. That one, I, I bought it and I didn't start it. Um, and I feel like I need, need, need to reread Three Body Problem. But Three Body Problem blew my mind. I was like, oh my God, the story's crazy. Yeah. Um, wait until you get that, to Dark Forest. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Okay, I'm going to go home. As soon as we get home, I'm going to pick that up. Um, but yeah, that one, that one was like... I also feel like the storytelling in that book is just so different from any other book I've read. So cool. Mm-hmm. Anyway, everyone... That, maybe that's the second one. <laughs> read the Three Body Problem trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. The, the dark, the bad thing is I read sci-fi before bed and I'll be like 40 pages in. And I'm like, Oh my God, it's 1 AM or 2 AM. I should go to sleep. It's <laughs> um, so funny. All right. So last question here before we, we wrap up, how do you continue to get better at your craft? Um, well, I think not just with, I think with everyone, if, if you're, if you're a learner and not a knower, you're way more likely to get better and improve. If you think you know everything, then, you know, anytime I, I think I know everything is when I make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I, I'm curious, um, and it's the same with, you know what, you probably will relate to this with skiing. Um, when you're skiing, if you think you know the route you're on and you're like, I can just do this, whatever, <laughs> you make mistakes because you're not thinking about the obstacles that are in your way and the turns you need to make and the other people who are there. You're assuming that you know everything you need to know to run down. But when you really get curious about like, huh, how's the power feeling today? Or how's the ice feeling today in the case of Vermont? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, if you stay curious and stay focused on like everything that's changing, you're way more likely to have like a successful run and like not fall and not hurt yourself, uh, not <laughs> injure anyone else. Um, so, but I think the same goes with everything. You, you really have to stay curious, stay stay engaged with what you're doing and um, learn from other people. Listen to your team, listen to the things, the ideas they have, help them create a voice and not create a voice, help them speak their mind and help Mm -hmm. them help you do a better job. Love it. Stay curious and stay engaged. Um, Yeah. So where can people find you on the internet? Uh, so on Twitter, I sometimes say really silly things. <laughs> uh, my, my handles across the web are Francium, uh, like the element, mm-hmm. uh, and that's where you can find me online. Great. Francesca, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah you too. This was so much, much fun. 